One of the most common things that people oftentimes ask me is, Brandon, how do I start in Dynamics 365 X++? Maybe you're coming from Dynamics AX, you know, and you're just now starting to get new with the new stuff, or maybe you're, you're in D365 and maybe you just started developing and you're getting a refresher, or maybe you're just brand new to, brand new to Dynamics 365 period. Our MB500 course, takes a developer from brand new into intro. That's what makes it so nice. Now, the thing about a course is, a course, I'm a big believer that there's a course and you always cover all the custom stuff or you always cover all the stuff in a course, but then there's also this custom part. That custom part makes it specific to where you learn it. For me, I like to add a lot to courses. So in this particular course, we've added about 40%. And in this particular lesson, what I like is we're actually previewing one of the demonstrations because many people asked for it. And I thought, okay, sure, yeah, I'll preview a demonstration for you, not a problem, but then it hit me. This is a really helpful demonstration. If someone's just starting, why not preview it? It's 30 minutes, which some of our demonstrations are quite long, and it takes you through and explains exactly what you need when you walk in on a bare bones basis to be able to get started developing. Now, there's all kinds of custom tools and things like that, but to me, these would be the essentials for a developer. It's a lot of fun, really, really big pleasure. I know there've been a lot of questions asking, when is the course gonna come out? April, the, it's gonna come out on the last day of April of this month, 2020, we're still on schedule. Just wanna let everybody know that. And I know, I know it's been a long delay. I mean, I mean, let's face it, it's almost been two years of putting it together. It's taken a tremendous amount of time to build all these custom labs and whatever else, but there were a lot of challenges. You know, I mean, I mean, this business moves fast. Sometimes we build labs and they just be broken. A lot of those mechanisms we put in, I've scaled up. At first it was just me writing labs. Now I have an organization that's, you know, almost 20 people. And that's what it took just to maintain the dynamics courses, plus our consulting. And I think that that's been extremely significant in that I'm really looking forward to quality. I'm proud to say what's coming out. I really hope it's a big benefit. I deeply appreciate whenever people like it. So please, you know, watch the video and you guys will see this is a real live course video understand how we teach, understand how the course is delivered so it can answer any questions, and really hope you guys get it as a great start to your career. We're not gonna stop giving excellent free content also. Our courses are gonna be heavy on the hands-on labs, of course, and there's plenty of other deep, deep demonstrations that are, that are very, very specific, like some of the new stuff on external services and things like that that we've included. In the MB300, some of the new stuff on data migrations that we've included. I think that it's a big honor to be able to release this. So everyone just please, thank you so much. Take care, you know how to reach me. And hey, keep on learning and keep on getting there. Bye-bye everybody. <laughs>
connect to source control, right? I mean, that's it. You want to get right on there and you want to make sure that your stuff is checked in. I mean, it's the first thing kind of like, you know, you tell development or something. So let's go ahead and cover those steps first. So the first thing I do personally, whenever I connect is I first get on, forgive me my mouse, and I disable get first. If you don't, something irritating is going to happen. Your first check-in will actually connect to the Git repository, and then you have to go delete the repository and get all and get all, and get all frustrated. And as of today's date, as of right now, as of as soon as April of 2020, Git is still not supported for Dynamics 365 finance and operations. Although there are some people who've gotten it to work with some custom workarounds and stuff. Um, unless you want to spend a lot of time and run into funny issues. I would not recommend this necessarily. Some people may may disagree with me though, so keep that in mind. Just as in my own objective opinion, that I find it's usually easier to go with the more supported things in this particular cases. Okay, now to do that, it's pretty easy. You're going to go over here down to tools. So you start out tools, and you try to, and you also tell every other developer on the team if you're going to use my machine, you're going to use the developer machine. And by the way, a lot of times you see people sharing development machines right now. Why? Well, same reason as previously, the expense of having new machines, new licenses, and particularly in the cloud, a lot of times people don't feel comfortable. A lot of customers, a lot of implementations don't feel comfortable with multiple different machines. So they like to have one shared machine. Okay, so we go to tools, options. There are the options right there. Now, inside of the options, we're going to go ahead and click on source control in this case. And inside of source control, as you guys can see, we're going to come inside and you guys are going to see that we're going to go ahead and go to the plugin selection. Now, inside of the plugin selection, your co your current source control plugin needs to be set to Visual Studio Team Foundation Server. All right. And then just hit OK. Got it. That's pretty easy. And the main reason is because you want to make sure um, that you've actually configured it not to go to get just by default so that you don't do it the headaches of having wrongful check-ins and you want to remind all the developers to please do that when they access the machine or if something happens like they run a visual studio update or something like that or they download some sort of um plug some sort of plug in into individual studio or package that suddenly leads to it resetting itself back to get trust me i've had so many things cause resets back to get so many things more than you could even believe I've downloaded custom plugins, code editing tools, things like that that are really cool. And the next, you know, boom, back to Git, messes it up. I do some check-in and it all goes to Git. And there I am turning around, you know, having to delete a Git repository and recheck things back out. And it's just a big pain. All right, next up. So you've got your TFS first, and which will save you a lot of time, believe it or not. The next thing you know is debugging can also be a little bit of an issue. So here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into C and temp. Open this up. Go to C. Go to temp. It doesn't have to be C temp. It can be any folder you want. But basically what we want to do is we want to go ahead and install our cache files, right? Or not cache, I mean our symbol files. These are the files needed for debugging. Now, the reason why you want to do it here instead of just per the project is if you do it per the project, you have a much smaller footprint, but then your debug is constantly stopping having to load the latest symbols and it becomes a big pain in the tushy. <laughs> Seriously, um, it can be. So usually what you end up doing is you'll take a new folder over here I'll call it, I'll just call it symbols. I'm going to store them over there. There we go. Got it. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back into our favorite source over there. So this time I'll go Dynamics 365 options. This time inside of options for Dynamics 365, um, um, I'm going to go down and I'm going to go into de debugging for a moment. So there's debugging. And I'm going to load the pseudons and, and where it has load symbols for items in the solution, I'm just going to go ahead and uncheck it. I want to load them all. Ordinarily, that's its default behavior, though. OK, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and hit OK. Oh, by the way, one more thing too: default browser to use. Um, sometimes you have to use Internet Explorer for certain things, like say you're doing workflows and things like that sometimes to debug, especially with the default. Actually, sometimes to even run the workflow packages, you have to do it. Uh, most of the time you can get away with Chrome, which Chrome is what I'm using right now. So I'll just change it to Chrome. But there are times where you will see different behavior, not as much as you used to. It used to be pretty bad, but you still see it a little bit. OK, so I'll put Chrome and I'll put OK. Now, what I'm going to do next is I'm going to come in and I'm going to go back in again to tools. 
and options and just showing you a different perspective here and I'm going to now go ahead and inside of the options now I'm going to go back to debugging and I'm going to go to symbols I'm going to set my symbols directory right so I'm going to say you know what download all the symbols from Microsoft so you see over there it's like uh oh it's going to do a massive download da, 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 right but still but you still get the point and it's going to download all the files needed for debugging into this local directory so I'm going to click browse C drive let's go down to temp and that tells us what we can use to be able to get to um, what we need there there we go there's C temp whatever else make sure that it's on all modules and click OK got it now the first time you start debugging it'll turn around and it'll actually and it'll actually bring it all into the symbols kit it'll bring them all um, it'll bring all the symbols into that particular folder that it, that can be used so then that way you can go ahead and actually debug your entire solution basically it's massive so if you want to make it shorter per project but in this particular case usually I like to just download them all because I like my debugging speed to go much faster and very seldom does one project really contain everything that you need if one project contains everything that you need to be able to see for a debugging troubleshooting case or something then it doesn't make sense but if you're having to debug and start with the breakpoint and then find that initial point it can save you a whole lot of time trust me all right next step now I need to go ahead and connect to source control right that's extremely important so I'm gonna go to team and inside of team I'm gonna now go to manage connections and you guys see I've already connected to a to, a, to an environment here and by the way for our training as you guys can see we set you up with all the different licenses so all this information should be included with inside of your inside of your introductory email which includes connection information usernames and passwords all that's covered um, all the licensing is covered so there's no need for any additional licensing that should have been also added inside of the plugin that's all set up and counted inside the price of the course so just to keep that in mind for convenience now dynamics 365 options now right inside of here um, or I'm sorry I'm sorry about that teams connections <laughs> manage connections <laughs> now once we click on manage connections we're going to connect to a team project and you see over here you put in the you put in the address of your DevOps which has been set up before this so there's our DevOps DevOps by the way by the way at this time when I first set this up it used to be called Visual Studio Online you know but now we've got the cool name DevOps and and you're gonna go ahead and, and then and then go ahead and check it and you guys will notice that inside of the class you're gonna have a particular project pre-created for you inside of DevOps where you have all the licenses and all the permissions and that particular class um, and that particular project is gonna have your first student name followed by the appendix project so you'll get a user ID and it'll be your user ID for logging in plus project user ID plus project and that'll be good so keep that in mind you will need this project because you're gonna do a lot of things in it remember that inside of our course you're not just doing the regular parts we've got extra labs where you're gonna have to learn how to truly set up Visual Studio lifecycle services coming from the very beginning because it's very very important this is one of the many value added ads that were labs that we're doing and so far we have over 20 different additional sections and we're and we're adding constantly as things continue to change so keep that in mind okay now next up so you guys are rocking and rolling you've got your project let me just connect to this demo three for class you know because I'm, I'm already connected but you get the point so then hit connect excellent do 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 all right now you have a pre-configured project even though there's going to be a another section inside of a later part of the course that shows you how to configure a project but when we get there we're going to have a more deeper discussion about different project configurations right now there's a lot of things out there on projects I'm going to tell you guys what Microsoft recommends I'm going to tell you guys what I recommend which differs a little bit for different reasons though I mean we're still there it's just that I tend to do it a little bit differently on setting up my projects for ease of use and to be able to to be able to maintain the source control process and I think Microsoft's is definitely a very best practice from a high-end engineering software shop perspective I'm not saying any any process is wrong or right what I've learned about source control is you do what works for you that's the biggest key what works for you is what works ultimately okay now next up let's go to view other windows 
So there's view. You guys can see it. There's other windows. And there is Source Control Explorer. Source Control Explorer is your friend. If you've never used it, you will love it. It shows you all your projects. It shows you all the action that's going on on projects from pending changes to you name it. And it also shows you everything else too. Now, um, including, you know, you can see history, things like that, you name it. Now, you'll notice that I have an accidental check-in over here where I was displaying a point which broke my structure. And you'll notice that I have a main and I have a trunk. Let's go down over here and take a look. More discussions on that coming. And in my main, I have a metadata and projects. And in my trunk, I have a metadata and projects. Metadata and projects are the two minimum folder structures that need to be created inside of your project. This doesn't need to be created. That's completely, that's completely um, ridiculous. So la 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 la. By the way, that lab is very, very fun. That's the lab where we have you write a custom external service. And I do mean a custom external service with about a gazillion parts. It's the only way to learn it. So for those of you who are taking the course and are going to experience the pain, don't worry. It's worth it. It will teach you custom service inside and out, and you'll be able to do some fascinating things, all kinds of compression, all kinds of things like that, being able to set up reading barcodes. I mean, it's the foundation. And when I say foundation, I mean a nice 27-page custom foundation. Woo! Okay, let me shut up. Let me shut up. That's different. That's a different, that's a different custom add-on. All right, now, going back. We're, so we're, we're inside now. You've got your main, you've got your trunk. Now, very, very important to understand is that one of the reasons why we at least create two folder structures is because of branching, right? Branching is where we'll typically have a trunk where we'll merge everything. And then main is where we have all these different machines. Now, first of all, the number one mistake that a software shop can work can make is over branching. So literally, I'm on an implementation that's $20 million, bunches and bunches of developers, you name it. I walk in and the code is completely broken and there are brilliant developers, well-known developers in the dynamics industry. I mean, just brilliant, 12, 13, 14 years of experience. But yet the client's not testing any code. No code has actually been promoted for pre-prod. So a classic case, and whenever you see something like that, very, very often, that means something's broken in the code process. Now, not necessarily the code process. It could also be the process of people testing, the process of people handing off. But in this case, it was the code process. So when I looked at how the architect had set up the code, the architect had set up the code with 50 different branches. They created a branch for each project. And sadly enough, that's not the first time I've ever seen that. First of all, branches are for merging. When you have major updates, when you have independent streams of development, or, or, or highly, highly segregated streams of development, that's when you branch. Branch is when you create, is for those of you brand new, an independent copy of code. Almost independent, not quite. Now what happens is because it's created, you can then merge it through the Visual Studio tools inside of a user-friendly fashion. And after that, you've got certain advantages like rolling back, seeing where it came from maintaining the history as you begin to merge it somewhere else, going off and doing a bunch of development. Maybe you've got a product feature that's not finished yet. So you need to work with an older version before you can then turn around and do what's known as a merge for a new version. But let me explain something. Merging, as much as there might be tools that show you how to compare, it's not automatic and it never will be. Not if you want to be safe. It requires that a human being approve and unapprove the changes. Now, some people are like, just merge all the new changes with the old. Yeah, I used to believe you could do that too. And then I got on real world. Let me tell you something. Most of the time when you merge, you better be looking at that code and seeing what's merged and what's not because you never know what needs to be written or what needs to be kept in order to make something compatible with, with whatever solution was brought in during the testing. That's the reason why you can't just go old and new. Sometimes it really does need to resemble the old or sometimes you need to alter the code just a little bit so that it keeps the new functionality but also maintains the compatibility that the old company had. All those sorts of situations happen in merging. So typically what I'll do is I'll create one particular branch at the beginning of a smaller implementation. And usually I try to keep a maximum of four branches anyway, just honestly. Now, if I'm Microsoft and I've got 3,000 developers or something, that's different. There's a real need to create many, many, many branches. But when I'm on implementations that have 
the average implementation, even big, massive billion dollar companies have maybe five developers on them, eight developers max. That's too many branches, unless you've been doing it for like 10 years or something and you've got branches from a long time, I find. Just my own personal opinion. Anyway, though, it's your call. You guys can read where Microsoft says release branch, re branch reach update, blah, 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 stuff like that. And you're welcome to follow those those opinions. Um, I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just simply saying what my preference is because merging is a lot of work. And the thing is, in a lot of companies, you don't have a dedicated build administrator, someone who's got all day long just to sit back and do builds for Dynamics. You, have you, you see it in .NET when you see massive teams, but... In Dynamics, very, very seldom do I, in fact, maybe only one time have I ever seen a dedicated build administrator for Dynamics who didn't have some, who whose job was solely doing builds and nothing else. At Microsoft, you got that. You have to, because of the size. In ISVs, you typically get that too, some of the big ones. That's where you might be able to see more of a, dis, more of a divergent pattern. So anyway, all right. Now, inside of there, when I come in, let's say this is main, and main is where all the, main um, um there's my main branch there's my trunk so i'm sorry about that main is where i'm putting in this particular you know my featured branch over here which is only one so one is going to be main to start out with but it depends whatever i want to call them there's plenty of naming standards and then i got my trunk which is the main which is the true main because that's where everything really goes and there's my metadata there are my projects and what you can see over here is that i've got a very interesting part now i check in my models for metadata and this is where i'm able to maintain my code structure so metadata right there with the code you guys can see it there we go there we go there we go and you guys can see where i've created where i've went out and checked this in and i have a branch going so now i can check all my coding so you guys see at the very beginning you guys will see a metadata set up now we're going to preset this up for you although although that lab could change in the future and that's because there's a demonstration going through how to set this up as a t as a vsts um, reference inside of module number two that's the reason why over here because this is still the overview we're going to get more into deeper dive a little bit more into some of these topics but i feel like this was necessary at the beginning so you will need to go ahead and connect now we did not connect you to the project because we want you to do it so that you learn how to do it keep that in mind all right now once we go inside of there, we're going to go into source control. We're going to go to workspace and you're going to go ahead and click workspaces. Now it's going to give you a default name because it always does. The first time that you connect, click on edit or you'll click at if you want to do first time. Let's do it. In fact, you know, let's do it first time. Let's play it. We're going to, well, we can't really play first time because we've already done it. So let's click at it. <laughs> now inside of edit, let's click on advanced. Advanced is my, a little bit easier for us to see and things like that for me anyway. And let's just take a look. And there's demo comp, and unfortunately that looks extremely confusing because there's so many working folders, and there really shouldn't be that many working folders. In fact, that's bad. So the only two that need, that need to be here are metadata and projects. The other ones were because of an accidental mistake. So I'm just going to click on them and start removing them real quick. There we go. And now there's metadata and there's projects. And notice over here that inside of the metadata we map it to the aos services packages local directory now for those for this is the local dev machine which you can do more and more with nowadays as opposed to the past where you couldn't hardly do like 60 percent mainly and that was it or you or you could only do 60 percent and on your cloud drives it'll typically be in the j or the k drive as of now sometimes they change it though they keep on changing the letters so that's why i'm hesitant to say but you can always look it up and microsoft will always have it on their website map your metadata to whatever, map your projects over to whatever. Projects are, of course, going to be the saved project files. This is a different way of thinking about projects than the past because now projects depend directly on source control to become active. They're not actually in the AOT, as you'll see, like they used to be. They are into your source control, which it's assumed that if you're running Dynamics 365, you are always using source control. And then there's the packages local directory. And that's where your code is. So you're going to come in, and you're going to basically type it in. You're going to go ahead and set it. So first, you're going to click over here. Go to your project, which your project will, is all that will appear because of your permissions. Mine, I'm an admin. And you're going to go down in your trunk, and you're going to select the metadata, and you're going to click OK. Then you're going to come inside of here for the local folder. And the local folder is the folder that it pulls the code in on the actual computer that you're using, whether it be cloud computer or whether it be main or whether it be a local VM like this case. 
which happens to be in the cloud, but that's a different story. And you're going to go down to AOS service. And then you see over here, packages, local directory. In this case, it'll always be in your packages, local directory, always cross check with Microsoft in case they, in case they change the location. Usually it'll be in J or K. Okay. Now, then you're going to come in and you're going to now map the projects. Very, very important. The projects are these. And if you just take a look, let's just take a look here. So we can see this because it's very important. So let's go to C. Users, whoops, let me just make this bigger. There we go. And let's go down to users for a moment. And inside of users, um, let's go ahead and take this for just a moment and let's go into administrator. There it is. Sorry, I was looking for that. And then inside of administrator, let's click on documents. And then inside of documents, let's click on Visual Studio 2015. And then let's click on projects. And now inside of projects, you guys see plenty of sloppy projects, but basically when you load your file data, it would actually download all the projects here. So this keeps your projects in sync per the team. This is why this is the new way of projects. And we'll discuss projects and things like that and how it all sort of works together in a later section of the course. Now, coming up next, and you do want to be witness that later section so that it makes sense to you. It's really not all that difficult, but to get past the confusion that might be there for those of you brand new. Now, inside of here, you want to go to the next part. If you take a look at CAOS, though, you'll notice that these are all, if you notice over here, just keep on going down, of your models. And we're going to be talking about models coming up in the next lesson. Very, very important discussion we're going to be having on models. It's very critical to understand it. Believe me. But this is where your code is. So this is where your code gets synced when you make your changes. <gasps> oh my God, there's something significant about these models, isn't there? We're going to be talking about that coming up. So just, you know, let's continue on that part. All right, now, you've got your models. You got this part going on. Now, what's going to happen next is we're going to we're going to go ahead and map that in. So we're going to finish that and we're going to click OK. And we're going to go ahead now. We're going to click close. Sure. Why not get the latest files? And now you're syncing, right? Getting with with the overall code deployment. So very, very important for being able to keep your files in sync. Now let's click close. And when you come down and when you come in, you'll notice that now we have it mapped. If you see local path and source control explorer, source control explorer is really cool. Cause you can also see other things, right? Right click, get the latest version. If you need to have a code element in there after it's checked in, you can get the history. And by the way, we'll be doing check-ins throughout the course. So don't worry when we get to development, you guys will do plenty of check-ins, plenty of things like that. So keep in mind that it's one of the many custom sections that's added. And believe me, you guys are loaded with more than enough custom sections added to the course um, to give you the add on. But we also do cover everything. So keep that in mind. And in here, you can go ahead and see all the things you need to see. You can view the latest version. You can you can check the pending history. You can do merge, merges. You can compare what changed. You'll use it all. Well, you'll use most of it. Trust me. <laughs> and you'll love it. You'll definitely love it. So big, big advantage over there. Kudos to Microsoft for making things more friendly with modern code times. Now, and things have even gotten more friendly, as you guys will see, as we're about to add a couple more tools. So now you've got you've got your Source Control Explorer. You understand Source Control Explorer is kind of like your poobah of, aha, I need to see the history of code. I need to see what's going on. And this is all the cool stuff. But it's not over yet. See, Microsoft, this is kind of something that's kind of hard to get used to. And let me talk about this for a moment. Microsoft has added a lot of changes, okay? One of the things that they've done, there we go, we'll go back. One of the things that they've done now is a lot of your newest and greatest scripts and functionality is now in the Git library as add-ons. Yep, sure is. Or the PowerShell gallery. Microsoft releases a lot of official stuff. Sometimes people in the community too do with the support of even Microsoft. And you need that stuff to be able to do your job nowadays. So something that'll get you if you're brand new and you're coming from, from Dynamics AX is you may not really remember having to do that. 
there were a couple of good things. Like for example, there was there was Dynaperf and things like that that were more kind of like a Microsoft quote unquote open source effort. But today, if you want to be able to run PowerShell, for example, you're using, you are straight up using um, a download. So let me show you what I'm talking about. So I'm gonna come, come over here. We're gonna be using a little friendly part. And let's go in and let's let's copy and paste. Let me just move my mouse off because I got a little copy over here. This link over here to our first thing that we're gonna want to install. Very, very important. You need the ability to do PowerShell. Not only that, you need the ability to be able to do things that are very, very important, like backing up databases and stuff like that and restoring them and la 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 la. And there's a lot of PowerShell that helps with that. Microsoft is now released, if you guys notice, Microsoft has released the Microsoft has released the D365 FO dot tools. Absolutely essential. Essential, essential, essential to being able to use and save time on a development perspective. There's so many things here. This tool is constantly changing. And to be honest with you, you know, one of the things we talked about was that the courses nowadays, just as the Microsoft courses I find for development or the Microsoft products are constantly changing, the courses are also need to are also in need of constantly being changed a little bit, being altered, being added. So one of the things you guys will see is we had six months, six months of access. During that six months of access that you have, we're constantly changing these courses. This is not a process. Every two weeks, we are going to basically be adding something to the courses, and that's our commitment. That means twice a month, you're getting updates so you can stay tuned because this stuff is coming out even faster than normal in the development end. Users are seeing one stream that's coming out whenever they do releases. We're seeing a whole other stream in terms of our technical requirements, our development and our learning, where we need to make adjustments. So at twice a month, we're able to come out with plenty of things. And there's so many different topics that have just came out even since starting the development of this course. I mean, the original version of this course was written two, three years ago, almost, almost three. Right now, there are so many things that have changed since that time. The, it's so evolved. Anyway, this is one of the cases. So here's your install module name, d365fo.tools. Now, let me talk about how to install this and make this pretty easy, easy so you guys can all see it over here because this is going to be extremely important. Okay, so let's see how to install the Dynamics 365 fo.tools that we're going to need to be able to essentially do a lot of really cool things, which will be topics of some of the future labs, by the way. Um, and this tool is constantly changing, so it's a lot of fun. So first, just because I'm old school, and there is a Visual Studio PowerShell if you like it. There's the command prompt, but I really like the PowerShell IDE or ISE, I guess, in this case. And that's just because it gives me a little nice little graphical part, and, and, I, and, and I just like it. I really do. Usually, I like, I like hardcore, you know, scripting areas too, but in this case, you know, what, what can you say? I got spoiled. <laughs> okay, so I'm bring up the PowerShell ISE. I just right-clicked, and I clicked Run as Administrator to make sure there's no issues. I'm gonna bring it up, and there we go. Now I can write down all my PowerShell commands, although there aren't many of them, so you get the point. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna tell it, find module space slash name space just to make sure it finds it now you don't even need to do that you really need to just click install but this is the old school way old school still works and i'm gonna come in there we go and now what i'm gonna do is there's the name right there and what I'm going to do is come inside. So you guys see there's the name. And I'm just going to pipe it a little bit. I'm going to do a pipe. And then I'm going to do an install. Whoops. Module. And go ahead and run it. It's going to go through. It's going to tell me, uh-oh, missing some new get, some things like that. So click yes. So you guys can just get the realistic experience here. I'm running it like this because this is what you will face when you're in your real live environments. And this is something that I haven't, I haven't really seen a configuration guide yet. After this course, I'm sure there will be one that someone will write on the net. But an all in one type one place to be able to get this is how you set up your development environment whenever you first start. All right. And of course, yes to all right. In other words, do you trust the PowerShell gallery? Sure. 
I mean, now that might change depending upon if you don't want some developer who's like, you know, or maybe some bad codes gotten in the PowerShell gallery that might compromise your security or something like that. So keep that in mind to go ahead and always do your checks. But in this term, you know, these are the basic things that are needed for us to be able to have the functionality that we need. And we do need the functionality. <laughs> I can say that. Very, very handy. Indeed. Some of these tools even work on the on-prem, some of the PowerShell commandlets, so you definitely want to get this. And there we go. That's our very first part. Now you've got the PowerShell. And if you want to see, you can just simply run git. And you can run a git, and you can run a git module. And you can see over there, there's the name, there's the whatever else right in there. So we're going to go ahead and put it in git name right over there. And you could just run this selection. And now let's go ahead and change just a little bit here. Let's let's put a little bit of a parameter there because you guys are going to like this. So just one second here. Okay. And if you want to get the module at first, you know, just to get it and make sure that you've got it and make sure that it's installed. That's what I just ran. But we knew it was, but just to double check. And in case you take over someone else's machine, which could be very, very he healthy. Or, or I'm sorry, very, very healthy and very, very helpful too. And now let's run a get command. Let's put in our module and let's copy over the d365fo.tools. And let's go ahead and run this. And now it's going to go ahead and run this particular command, which is going to tell us what are all the actual commands that are actually in there. And voila, look at this. And you see, I kind of like the IDE a little bit because you, I don't know, for me, it's more friendly because I see all my commands and things. I mean, you see them anyway. It depends what your preference is. It really does. And there they are in alphabetical order and a lot of really good things in there. You know, thumbprints, automation certificates, um, D365 SQL command, for example. Uh-oh, for some of you. Um, Azure storage, LCS environment. So really some very, very nice things that you can now do that are inside of there. The model file from the backpack, very, very important from your database restores and things like that. SQL change tracking as part of your script to enable that at the very, very end. Um, seeing some of the AOT individual objects that you can go in and do. Looking at compiler results, database access, you know, the decrypted configuration file. What's the default model for new projects? Installing an ODE package. So very, very nice things that are definitely there, including seeing the labels, the label files, and all of it contains the regular, the regular, you know, um, documentation also. So extremely important to be able to see. New backpack, things like that, you name it. Now, Looking at that, you all can see why that's so critical and why there's so many different labs that we could basically add to the course based on that, covering a number of topics. And this is constantly being added to. I mean, this is a continuous process, as you guys can see. If you guys look in here, you guys will notice in my latest iteration of this particular lab that I decided, this was eight hours ago. Eight hours ago. Whoops, sorry about that. Let me move this back over. So you can definitely see, let me just move this over here for a moment, back in this and snap it. There we go. So you can definitely see where we've, we've definitely had a big emphasis. Now that's very important. So you're going to need that. Okay. So now you know that you've got, oh, look at that, some extra tools. But guess what? The tools aren't done yet. You still got one more that you're going to need that's absolutely critical to be able to conduct your development environment. So now you've done debugging, you've done source control, you've gotten all these massive number of PowerShell tools that we really haven't even gone to yet because it's just the intro module. And all we're doing is setting up 
D365. This is our first demonstration. As we know, we've got plenty of other demonstrations coming in this course. Lots of them, you know, on the range of tens of lots of them and lots of labs too. But in your next section over here, you now want to come in and you need to go ahead and also enable something for builds. You see, automating builds can be a big advantage. It's a best practice. Now, if you're one person, it can still help you. And what happened was at the very beginning of D365, there was problems with automating builds. They had this automated build thing, but then you'd have to take the package and manually send it yourself into, into you know, the asset library. You'd, and it broke the complete automation and it was a big thing that people complained about. So Microsoft came back and released a number of automation tools a couple years ago. They're all PowerShell scripts. They're all open source. They can be altered also, which is even more important to be able to customize and get what you want. So let's take a look at those particular scripts right now. So let me get the scripts out. Let me just copy and paste. And here you guys will see the, the name of the link. Now, keep in mind that as much as we're going to be changing, as much as we change our courses, as much as we pride ourselves on having labs that work. And I told you guys a big deal in our course. Well, I guess I, I guess, sorry about that. Some of you are listening on the preview, but for those of you listening in the course, We've told you before, and you can see it in the documentation, a big deal is working labs. If there's any lab that does not work because there's been some change in the application, and by the way, every lab is tested. Everything's tested. The demonstrations, the labs, you name it. But if there's any one of the labs that has broken because there's been a change, which oftentimes happens, as we know, in this industry, let us know and we will fix it within, within two to three business days. Always. Most of the time, we'll fix it before that, but just in case it's something particularly complicated that requires that we rewrite a lab or something and that does happen in azure because let's face it we have multiple different distributed components azure office 365 dynamics lifecycle services i mean there's various places stuff can break and every department's not always in sync okay so we're going to go to the d365 finance and operations right there and this is a very interesting part because look at this you can directly automate uploading your packages into the LCS asset library. Why is that so big? Well, you guys will see once we start discussing uploads and stuff like that, but let's just say this. It's what actually turns around and allows for you to have a true automated build. Mm -hmm. It does. In the past, you had to stop, you, dump, you put them on a location, then you go in there and manually do it. Now you can go ahead and do that. And look at this, you can also update model versions. This was heavily requested. At one time, you don't even wanna know what we had to do to update model versions back in the day. We were doing it manually at first. So these, these five essential commands or tasks that go into your build pipeline are very, very big because they really allow us to now turn around and actually take it towards another step towards true continuous build automation. To me, this is not a continuous build yet. Continuous build is when we can go all the way to production with the strong code policy and things like that. Different people have different sort of definitions, but to me, that's continuous build of what I've seen. But this is definitely a big step in that now things are in the asset library and that it only takes a little click to get them there. So let's come over here. Let's go ahead and scroll down or scroll up and let's click get it for free. Now, once we click that, it's going to come back and tell us real quick, uh-oh, warning, la, 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 la. Does your organization actually allow this? And that's true. So after you click the request button, you get this message just like this. You know, you've already requested it. So now you have to go to your admin. Okay. Just so you guys see how to do this. Say you were the admin. This would normally be your part. You've already got the request. You don't click download over here. It won't work. Um, what you do instead is you make your request and then your administrator or whoever it is, if that's you, that's one thing, but whoever it is for the DevOps, you know, project and, and inside of DevOps that goes in with those permissions, administrator is going to come inside. So let's come into settings. And this is where I've logged in in private browser as the administrator. And I had to, I had to pause it just for a moment because there was some confidential information that I had, had to put inside of that particular screen. So that's why that was a little bit different because I didn't, I couldn't quite show that part popping up. Now for our, for our developer, for those of you inside of the lab um, or for this demo that are doing it, you won't have to go into DevOps and go approve it. But you see, I just want to show you this so you get the full picture in case you happen to be the administrator who does do the approving. And so you'll come in, you'll click approve. 
just like that. This way it can actually be installed to your full organization. And you see over there, they were telling it, it can be installed in Brandon Amat. So we're going to put that down. So now everyone has that particular extension now. So now we can proceed to the organization. There we go. And now what's happened is at this stage, if you go into organization settings, and if you go to, and if you come into organization of settings, and if you look inside of, if you look inside of um, extensions, and you look inside of installed system, ex installed extensions, there's your D365 FO extension. So now it's success successfully installed and this can now be deployed into various projects to be available into the pipeline for you to be able to utilize inside of your projects. Very, very important, very, very helpful. You can see that. So hope that definitely makes a lot of sense. And now you see you've got it available. So you see the biggest advantage. Now, let's talk about something else. So, by the way, just to make a quick note, if you did want to go ahead and finish that one on that last part, and for those of you who are going to be doing the lab, remember you're going to have to go into your extensions gallery at the end of the lab, but I'm saving that. And you're going to have to look under organization, which is not shown on this screen because you need to figure it out. <laughs> but I'm going to give you a very strong, strong hint. So this will be good. Let's just let's just go ahead and go to it real quick. Visual Studio Tools, Extensions and Updates. Hint, 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 hint. And somewhere you're going to need to be able to see where that organization has published all of those extensions to be able to, to be able to install it. I will do 95, 98 percent even on the demonstrations, but I will leave five percent, just five percent. And this is one of those cases. So I'm going to want you to go in there and actually install the extension on the actual lab. Now, going into that, that completes lesson number one. <laughs>